Our first panel is Navigating AI, Evolving Legal and Policy Frameworks. And I'm so thrilled that uh, moderating it for us today is Shelley Palmer, who's the CEO of the Palmer Group, a consulting practice that helps Fortune 500 companies with technology, media, and marketing. And he's also an ASCAP member, so one of your colleagues. Um, he's named LinkedIn's top voice in technology. He covers tech and business for Good Day New York, and he's a regular commentator on CNN and writes a very popular business blog, which has a ton about AI in it, so definitely read it. Shelly, come on out. Oh, Shelly, there you are. Hey there. The panel's gonna come up on stage, and I'm gonna talk for just a second. Thanks so much for the intro. Uh, I've been at ASCAP since I was born. Um, I was fortunate enough to win uh, ASCAP's 12th and 13th annual film and TV awards, one for most performed themes on TV, and the other for top TV series. That goes back a while. I have written a lot of music, and if I were to take the job today, which I will not, I would do the music for my 5,000th television commercial sometime this year. So I have written, it's quantity, folks. It's not quality. You <laughs> trust me. It's just bang this stuff out on command. And that's why I know personally, based on the AI tools that we have written and built for our clients, that this is a serious conversation. Way more serious than I could with any hyperbole, any hype, in any way uh, make more clear a couple things I want to talk about before we start this panel, because this panel is everything, and you're going to understand why this panel is everything in just a minute. First of all, for this conversation, I want you to open your mind as wide as you've ever opened it, and I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to snap my fingers, and then you all, with my Harry Potter-like powers, are going to be transformed into understanding that the tech is already there. Three, two, one, done. Now all of you understand, it's not imaginary. The tech is done. We don't understand it. The business rules have not been formed. The tech is done. We will never catch up to the tech. So don't start telling me, oh, it's not good at this, it's not good at that, it doesn't work here. It works everywhere for this conversation because sooner than you can imagine, it will work everywhere. It's that, that simple. Across 100% of every productivity function you could ever imagine. The thesis for today is productivity is the key driver of economic success. And we're talking only economic success. That's the definition. If you can do something faster and cheaper, you're going to win. You can't ever charge more for your stuff unless you're a premium provider. The market sets your price. But you can make it cost you less to produce your goods and services by increasing your productivity. That's what these tools do. And there isn't a CEO or a shareholder or a stakeholder in any business anywhere in the world who is gonna turn that down. They just aren't. So the tech is already there. Also, there's two kinds of tech we're talking about today. And it's really important that you make the distinction. One is the tech that you are very familiar with, and I mean very familiar with. It curates for us. We're curators. I'm a composer, producer, arranger. I curate notes. Uh, the TV programmer curates the lineup on TV. The social media person curates whatever it is they're going to curate about your experience. Disney World curates your experience in the park. We're all curators. And the AI we have touched so far is curation. It has curated. Our social media is curated. Our feeds are curated. We must produce it first. It sits in a pile of things that are produced, and then AI helps us decide what content is the right person, right place, right time, right message. That was then. These new tools generate. And what we're gonna talk about today is the difference between curation and generation. When I can generate with AI at low or no cost, when production costs are removed, and I can target by saying, I want to relentlessly pursue this target persona with something that will delight them, enrich their lives, touch them emotionally, and I'm gonna keep banging on them until I get it right by generating at low or no cost. Not curating, generating. That is the difference. I could go on for an hour, two hours about this, but I'm not going to because here's the most important thing I'm gonna tell you today. AI does a lot of amazing things. It is a word calculator. Generative AI is a word calculator. It is a music calculator. It's an image calculator. It's a video calculator. It calculates the next best thing it thinks that you want to see or hear or feel or know. It does that better than any human will ever do it. 
Here's what humans do. I'll use a completely out of the box, out of our, this world example. Say you're a pathologist. And you're looking at slides, looking for melanomas, and you're saying, well, is this cancerous or not? You, with your 40 years of experience in medical school, will look at this slide, and you're going to have four or five questions that you instantly ask. Is it misshapen? Does it look new? Is it weirdly colored? Is it... You have taken your 40 years of experience, and you have distilled it down into five or six questions that are algorithmic in nature that can be answered much better by other things than you, but you know the questions. It's called subject matter expertise in my world, but you can call it anything you want. Creativity, inspiration, whatever. Your part of this, your human part, is the ability to take your experience and distill those questions and then use these tools, use these tools to do the part that it does better and faster than you. Here's the thing. Everyone gets to use them. Why is this the most important panel we're ever going to talk about? Because the business rules are the only thing standing between us and the world I just described. The business rules that you make up, because people make up the business rules. You cannot stop the tech. But we can have copyrights. They can be enforced. We can have business policies. They can be enforced. We can have training policies that can be enforced by the rule of law, because we live in a country where there is the rule of law. And with that, I'm going to ask the following of you. I'm going to have the panel self-introduce, and they're each going to make an opening statement. And then uh, we're going to have what I lovingly call a Socratic discussion on the issue. Now, I may take my side, or I may take someone else's side, but I'm here for your entertainment. So um, if you want to learn more about how to do all this, go to courses.shellypalmer.com and take our very free, with no advertising, no obligations, absolutely free, online course about generative AI called, wait for it, Generative AI for Execs. You can get it at courses.shellypalmer.com. That's if you want to learn more about this. Uh, I actually am a very, 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 very excited um, proponent of this. It also terrifies me to the core of my being. So if you're not both thrilled and terrified by what you're about to hear and what we're talking about today, you don't understand it well enough. With that, ladies and gentlemen, our panel, let's give them a big hand. John, let's start with you. Just a quick statement and introduction. My name is John Riley. Uh, I am an assistant general counsel at the U.S. Copyright Office. I've been there for ten and a half years, and I think it was nine years ago we hosted ASCAP on the occasion of their 100th anniversary, and I can't believe that nine years have passed, uh, but I also can't believe how fast the speed of AI and these discussions have been going even in the last few months. Um, it is our number one priority at the office, and uh, I'm happy to talk to people today and you know, pass it along. Fantastic. Right. Catherine. All right. Uh, my name is Catherine Forrest, and uh, I am a, uh, a partner in the digital technology department of Paul Weiss, which is a large law firm here in New York. But before that, uh, I was a federal judge uh, here in the Southern District of New York. And before that, I also did a lot of work in the internet music space. And so I spent a lot of time uh, in that space. In the AI area, I've written a couple of books, one on algorithmic bias, one that just came out on uh, ethical Systems in Digital Environments. The first one's called When Machines Can Be Judge, Jury, and Executioner. The second one is called Is Justice Real When Reality Is Not? Uh, and I have a lot of, uh, you're right, right. It's a big debate. We could have a whole session on just that. And, uh, and I've written a lot of articles on AI. So I think, I guess this is my moment for my 30-second opening statement. I think that this is uh, the most transformative moment uh, that I've ever lived through. I'm almost 60 years old. and been through a lot of change and been through the digital sort of uh, transformation from analog and uh, a lot of technology change. But I think that the velocity of change that we're seeing is extraordinary. And there's great opportunity. And there's also reasons to be cautious. And we need a dialogue of stakeholders uh, to really incent uh, those who are making regulations and those who are looking hard at these issues uh, in the state and the federal areas to think about where the right guardrails should be. There's not a right and a wrong answer I that I necessarily think of. I just think that we need to have a conversation where the stakeholders are part of it. Yeah. Dan. Yep. Hi, I'm, I'm Dan Schnapp. I'm also a, a, a lawyer and a partner at Shepard Mullen, also in the city, a national, actually global firm. Um, I've been practicing for 30 years, um, really at the precipice of 
emerging technology and disruptive technologies and how it influences businesses across industry. Um, I'm the chair of the music practice and technology transactions practice at the firm. I've seen a lot. Um, I agree. It is a transformative technology. Um, it is a disruptive technology. It is going to change industries, including the music industry. But uh, although it might be scary, um, it's, it's, it shouldn't be viewed that way necessarily. Um, like I agree with Shelley, there are many opportunities to, to put guardrails um, and rules, around, uh, rules of the road around this. Um, I fully expect that the industry will lead, particularly in this country. Regulation, we're not going to wait for regulation. It, you, you'll, uh, no, no offense to the regulators, you're, we're not going to get there quick enough. It, this is a technology that's, that's racing at light speed. Um, and that's just simply because um, computing is, is there. Quantum computing is around the corner. Um, and, and this technology is ready for prime time. So we can't wait for that. Industry is going to solve these issues. ASCAP is going to be at the lead of, the, of, of that, that revolution in the music industry. I firmly believe that. Yeah, all right. So I was going to start with a joke. I was just going to say, hey, AI is going to kill us all disgust. But I've decided I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> No, I mean, you know, because I don't believe it and I just, it, I don't want to go for the cheap joke. AI is going to kill us all. No, no, sorry. Um, I was lucky enough to talk to seven associate counsels, including John at the Register of Copyrights a few uh, weeks ago. And in my composing career, there, as, there wasn't uh, a client, a creative services director, an agency producer, uh, anyone that didn't say to me, hey, Shelly, I want you to do blank and fill in the blank. And it could be, you know, here's Randy Newman's The Natural, knock it off, don't get me sued. That would be one. Or they could be telling me, you know, I want Frank Sinatra meeting at somebody at Taylor Swift's house with, you know, Willie Nelson sitting there playing guitar. However they would describe it, they would prompt me to create my work product. Exactly the same way that I prompt a generative AI tool to give me work product. And when I brought this up to John, John, you and your group said, not copyrightable, which is great because then you know, I would owe some copyrights to a bunch of advertising people that don't deserve it. Talk to me about this and copyright law currently. If my prompt is not copyrightable and the work product is not copyrightable out of the machine, what exactly are we doing here? It's a good question. Uh, so it, it's great to talk to an audience who knows a bit about copyright, but maybe for some of the folks um, in the virtual audience, I should say that you know copyright is the law that basically protects your work here. Um, when we talk about copyright and what it doesn't and does protect, you know, we have these tried and true concepts that um, you know, are as true for AI as they are for other circumstances. So uh, to get protection under the law, a work has to be um, an original work of authorship uh, fixed in a tangible medium of expression. That's the legalese for you. Um, but what that really means is it has to be something that is original to the author. It can't be copied from someone else. There has to be a modicum of creativity, um, and then it has to be fixed. And a part of that is a human authorship requirement. And so when we talk about prompts, because a lot of the, the foundational models use prompts to output um, generative AI, whether you want to call it works or materials or whatnot, um, the one discussion that we had was there's these existing kind of copyright concepts. Uh, short words and phrases aren't protected. Ideas aren't protected. Um, but the expression of those ideas may be if they are done by a human author. So the Copyright Office, um, that's nothing new under the world, right? So that's just how we are applying it to AI. We could talk a little bit about the outputs in a minute, but that is the, the kind of foundational copyright concepts, I think, at least at a high level. Boy, do I want to say something right now that I can't say. Um, hey, Dan, instead of me talking, why don't you talk for a second about that? <laughs> well, I, don't, I, I can't read your mind because I no, don't have okay. an AI brain, but I can tell you, I guess it's a gray, it's a gray area for sure, right? Um, but what level of human creativity is necessary in order to have copyright? That's really the issue, right? Um, and, and in order to do that, um, you kind of look at different technology along the way. You know, what's different 
about this technology um, is that it, the generative piece of AI is that it's semi-random, right? Um, it's, it's trained on a variety of things um, and it's unpredictable um, in terms of its output. Right. Because if it was super predictable, then it would be a very narrow focus and I don't think anything that it actually creates would be worthwhile. Um, and, and have much value, at least in the creative industry. So let me, let me just clarify this for the audience because that's a really important point and it's not subtle and it's not trivial. Do not think for one second that your music that you copyrighted, that your recording is sitting in a database somewhere and that it is being referenced in its entirety and ripped off the way that somebody would play a record uh, and go, hmm, okay, uh, this is what I need to, this is the chord progression I need to knock off, this is the groove I need to knock off, this is the feel. If you took 100% of Bob Marley's music out of every training set ever used for music, it would not impact a generative AI's ability to write reggae at all. Not even, not, not any in any way. So this is a, in, these are, Three-dimensional representations, and I'm not going to get into the technical part. I'm happy to talk tech with anybody who wants to talk it. Um, the way that the generative AI tools are, are set up right now, which is not going to be forever, is that there is a three-dimensional representation of the next closest thing that needs to be surfaced. It calculates the next best note, word, chord, image, pixel, electromagnetic wave, whatever your language you're using, color and it just puts that there, rightly or wrongly. That's how it works. Your work is not being databased in the way you think about it. And if you wanna go deep into that, please just reach out to me. But I didn't want anyone to think that your work is sitting somewhere and being taken and used in its entirety and explored in its entirety. It's just not the way these tools work. But just Shelley, that being said, you know, and just to interrupt, I, I think <clears throat> there, you know, on the, you've got the input and the output issues from a copyright perspective and just a general legal perspective of how these tools work. And they may not be sitting in a reference database or a library where somebody just ripped off the entire thing and is, is pushing this out, right? It learns patterns, syntax, genre, exactly. all those things. But there are many tools out there that are reproducing parts of your copyrighted work. Um, and that, that is an issue, right? That, that is an issue. There's AI tools that, that rely on reproduction. There are other AI tools that, that rely on something called feature extraction that kind of analyze, that don't necessarily reproduce the actual content itself or pieces of the content, That's right. but analyze the syntax, the, the cadence, and predict what's going to come next. And Dan, that was my question to John and, and Catherine, you can weigh in on this because you've yeah. written about this deeply in your books. At the end of the day, it's unclear it is highly unclear what I get to copyright. Like chord progressions, John, you tell me they're not copyrightable, unless I have intent to rip off the chord progression because then I'm Ed Sheeran, I'm going to chord over my chord progression. So, uh, you know, where, where does, there's some subtleties in the current law, and then there's the AI uh, sort of attacking what that is and in this really gray zone, which doesn't seem to have a way that I can be protected, or it can be, like the output's not even protected. Well, can, let, let me just sort of, um, I wanna separate a couple of things. One is uh, the concept of uh, the music that, whether it's gonna be the song, or whether it's gonna be the, uh, I mean the lyrics, or it's gonna be the composition that's put into the model. And then uh, the AI portion, and then the human portion. The human portion we know uh, we'll have a sufficient amount of expression that you folks all have copyrighted works. Everybody in this room has probably got copyrighted works. One of the questions I think we need to ask ourselves is do we want the AI to have a copyright ability? Do we want it to be copyrightable? I think we are assuming maybe yes. People think, well, if I'm going to use it, maybe I want to be able to copyright it. But I think it's a serious question that one has to ask, at least to sort of bring us back to basic principles, because the Constitution really was to incent the human's creativity and to create the right balance between the exclusive rights and not. That's one thing. The second thing is that uh, when we say that your music is not sort of sitting in a database someplace where it's going to be referenced, the, uh, the sounds and the in the style of is 
something that can be referenced in these databases. And that's, I think, a little bit of what you, know, what you were getting at. And so when the models are actually taking the music in, and they are, and they're analyzing it in chunks. And it's quite complicated when you're analyzing, for instance, a sound recording, and you have to take certain numbers of chords in chunks, and you have to layer it on to certain lyrics, and you have to layer it on to percussion. And it can become very, very complicated. But you could, with Bob Marley, for instance, if you took all of Bob Marley out and you were successful, you would not be able to do in the style of. So it does impact it. So I would say. Oh, well, wait, Catherine, let's just unpack that. You, you wouldn't be able to do in the style of Bob Marley unless it knew that Bob Marley was a reggae performer, which from just pure text they would, in which case it would give you reggae. Now, would it be Bob Marley style reggae? No, but it would be reggae. Well, I'm saying you can certainly do reggae, but I'm saying if you want to do, and a lot of folks do these days, want to do in the style sure, of. Sure, absolutely. Okay, and there's a whole debate to be had about what that does in yes. terms of the concept of expression and the copyrights offices. Uh, understanding and the way the law has developed around expression. But in the style of does require the input of the basic style of the underlying art, whether that be lyrics, whether it be a sound, uh, whether it be the composition. So that's just one thing that I wanted so to So let me ask you a question. So, uh, every musicologist that I've ever worked with ever in the world has uh, named genres sometimes subgenres, you know, crunk in Miami with the, you know, down to like the Brickle District or whatever. It's like, there's a lot of different delineations of musicologists put on music. Um, once you actually understand, you geek, someone gives you a piece, oh, we'll just keep using reggae. Someone gives you a piece of reggae music and they say, you know, knock this off. I want it to be, I want a reggae song. You're not writing a symphony. You're not writing a rock and roll song. You, there are rules, algorithmic rules. As an arranger, you would follow, right? As a producer, you would follow to make it recognizable to someone that is the genre of reggae. Help me understand where we go copyright-wise, and, and then I want to switch to business rules, but copyright-wise, how does that even work? Well, in terms of uh, copyright-wise, I'm not really... You said in the style of, and I'm well, saying in I'm the saying, genre of. Okay, in the genre of, in the style of. So I think there's a difference between being in the genre of reggae and being in the style of Bob Marley. Because I think that what you would find is the way that these can break it down, just like it can, AI, generative AI can, with a novel or a poem or the style of a reporter's particular writing, is there are ways in which there's entry into a musical chord. There are ways in which lyrics are put together. There is a kind of uh, use of the voice. And so you're going to have differences in the style of versus in the genre of. Okay. Now, one thing, um, and I'd be very curious about John's take on this, one thing that I think in terms of the human involvement is it's not just a single prompt. Anybody who's been out there who's used, you know, you know, st you know, stable diffusion or any of these tools, Wally, -E, whatever you want to call it, any of the music tools. Dolly, also. not Wally, but I got Dolly. You. Yeah, <laughs> Wally would be the you little, little robot. The, yeah. the grand, the grandchildren yeah. watching too much Wally. Oh, okay. And uh, in any brilliant. event, uh, scarred by it forever. So uh, in any event, uh, <laughs> like the uh, one of the things I think that you find when you look at any of these tools, and you work with them, is it's not a single prompt. It's often, I would like this. No, I'd like to change it now to this. Can you do a little bit more of this? Can you do a little bit more of that? And so I think if you do a single prompt and you're done, maybe it's not copyrightable. But I would say to John, if what I did, and I'm able to show you that my concept was to use this particular tool to do x, y, or z, and then I changed it, and I said, now give it to me, give it to me a little bit slower, take it down, give it to me in a different key, Take it, you know, take it over here and give it to me with the words now change so it's a little bit more this way versus that way. And I can show you my progression of human involvement. Is that not copyrightable? That's got to be copyrightable. That's a good question and a great transition because the Copyright Office has uh, kicked off its own study of AI. And these are the ty exactly the types of questions we're being asked. So. Uh, in this spring, we announced that we were uh, discussing a policy that, that really reflects kind of our, our own ongoing understanding of copyright law about copyright registration. But we also announced that we would be having uh, listening sessions, which we have now held, which would be followed by a publication in the Federal Register with several questions, including questions just like that one. Um, that is going to be published by the end of the summer. And 
we know Congress is listening because um, they have already taken some of the uh, people who have spoke at our listening sessions and asked them to testify before Congress themselves. We have uh, weekly conversations with congressional staff about AI issues all the time. That is a, is a good question because it's not so far off from someone saying, you know, uh, I want you to paint uh, a line here and draw a line here and color it blue and then the outcome is a painting that would be totally copyrightable. The dividing lines are, are part of the big questions around here. Um, the office ultimately is going to issue some pol policy recommendations. It may be one, it may be several on AI. And this is the part where I say, you know, we've talked a lot today about having your voice he heard. When that notification of inquiry is published later this summer, we want to hear from you. We will have roundtables in the spring. We want to hear from you. And talk to your members of Congress as well. This is on the top of everybody's minds, and it's not just the traditional jurisdictions in Congress. It's not just the Judiciary Committees who are interested. There's a lot of members of Congress interested in this. And I don't know the dividing line right now, but that's why we're having these conversations. So here's the thing I wanted everyone to keep in mind. Imagine the tech is already there. Raise your hand if you've heard the term, term autonomous agent. Okay, three of you. So an autonomous agent <laughs> is a stacked, recursively stacked set of AI models. So rather than just GPT-4 or DaVinci or Claude or hugging face models of whatever description, you stack them and you actually enlist them to do something for you. And an autonomous agent, you don't give it a task as Catherine just described, and then produce, although that's always an option you can do with any kind of conversational AI interface. With an autonomous agent, you give it a goal. Please produce the Shelley Palmer show. It's a cutting edge video about the blah blah that does that, and give me 25 social media posts, and give me a social plan, give me a paid plan, give me the synopsis and log lines, and that's all you write. You just write your goal, and it does the rest. It's called an autonomous agent. There's an autonomous agent that was done yesterday by a company called Fable Studios. They produced a th uh, full episode of South Park, 100% by AI. Most of my friends think it's a joke and think it was Matt and Trey that did it. I don't think so, because the, I think it's real. You go look it up, you could find the blog post at ShellyPalmer.com. It's the first time I have ever seen a fully, 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 fully autonomous agent do production. So this is coming fast and furious, and while it's possible a conversational AI interface is just that, you converse, as Catherine just described, an autonomous agent, you set goals. And so I'd like to switch to the business rules that will protect us against that goal setting tool set, because ultimately, as a composer, um, this is making me super sad, just saying. And I would love to understand, I wrote an article a few months back, it might even be a year now, probably is closer to a year, what would ASCAP for AI look like? And I would love to understand what a performing rights society could hope to accomplish. And I'd love to understand, like, just theoretically, not in practice, but like, is there a way that we could go to, to Washington as a group? Is there a way that we can band together as creators and say, hey, we got to get paid. We ultimately are the humans behind this. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> I know I was going to get that in there somewhere. Well. Let me start by talking about what's available now in terms of, uh, and then we can get into sort of uh, the March on Washington. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, what's available right now um, to people is frankly unclear, right? We don't have the answer yet to the outcome of several cases that have already been filed uh, on, these, uh, on these very issues. There are now about eight cases that are filed around the country, most of them in California, but one in Delaware. The FTC has started an, open, has started an investigation uh, that are looking at the copyright issues, that are looking at some of the potential unfair competition issues, and we don't know the answer yet. What we do know is that there is an attempt to utilize currently existing laws that would be the copyright laws for direct infringement, uh, a right of publicity potentially, uh, issues having to do with name and license, likeness, uh, certain not for this audience, but uh, for other things, biometric information. Actually, it does affect voice patterning, so that it could be relevant. So there are various laws that are already in place that can be utilized. The question is the time frame. 
because I was a judge and I used to move my docket really fast. But it takes time to bring a case. And it's expensive to bring a case. And so time is not on our side in terms of figuring out what the answers are. And I think that what we need more than anything is not a particular answer. We need an answer. People need clarity. Because it's, what's that? Yeah. And uh, to try and get clarity, I think, is first and foremost. And we need it in our lifetime, not in the lifetime uh, that Congress acts with it, within. John? <laughs> so, right. You know, backing things up, uh, uh, that was a lot to unpack there, and that was great. On the copyright side of things, um, you know, we have to kind of consider when we're enforcing rights what rights are being infringed. We heard that you know, several of these AI uh, technologies will make a reproduction as part of, however you want to phrase it, uh, looking at, scanning, or figuring out others' works. They, they have um, ingestion, I think, is, is maybe a, a, an inapt word, but what I'm going to use for now. So when these uh, technologies ingest hundreds of thousands, if not millions of works, uh, that reproduction, even though it may be a temporary reproduction, uh, would trigger copyright. And so what the uh, assertions are is that violation um, infringes the copyright owner's exclusive rights. And then in response, the big question is, is it a fair use? And although I am at the copyright office, only a judge can tell you if, or a court rather, can tell you if something is a fair use or not. Well, it's lucky we have Dan here who will go right before any judge and go and litigate this. So tell me what fair use is and how I'm gonna live long enough to get a fair use ruling on this and, the, and, and, and a judge that understands what we're talking about. Well, I could tell you about fair use, I'll never litigate it. I could tell you that because I'm a deal lawyer. But um, it is, <laughs> It, 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 is, it is a defense that the AI platforms are asserting, um, and they are saying that for training purposes, for example, that they don't necessarily need a license from you to, to ingest, for lack of a better word, or analyze um, your works um, into their library. That's not necessarily going to be the case. Um, it's a fact-specific uh, determination, and there is a case that went to the Supreme Court that we think um, will serve as precedent in the AI context. It was not, you probably heard of it, it's Goldsmith, Goldsmith versus Warhol. It was the Orange Prince case. Um, it was a, a, a picture of Prince that was taken and um, Warhol um, created this Warhol effect on, on, the, uh, on the photo. And, um, and then the estate licensed it to Condé Nast for publication and the photographer said, hey, that's mine. Um, and they claimed fair use, the Warhol State did. Uh, the Supreme Court basically, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, decided that it wasn't. Um, and they looked at, um, there are four factors in just generally fair use defense. There are four factor analysis. The two factors that are involved in the AI context are really the purpose and the character of the use and whether it's transformative enough. And that's really the key in this case. Um, and we could talk about that a little bit more, but the, how transformative the extent to which the purpose is different, the secondary use, meaning this use by the Warhol estate and the license of that photo to Condé Nast, is that really different from what the photographer's initial use was, the copyright owner? And the answer is categorically no. It's the exact same purpose. They took the photo or they created this photo um, and this print for purposes of you know, commercializing it and selling it into the marketplace. The second factor that was really important of the four factors in fair use that the, the, the case looked at was the, the effect on the market for the original. Does this new Warhol orange prints dilute the value of the original? And, and the answer was you know, categorically yes. So um, you look at that in the AI context and how AI platforms work, at least currently today, and that, you know, might that might put a, you know, a, a bullet in, in the argument uh, that, that, that a, a, an AI model like a chat GPT or a Dolly or any, any image generator, text generator, voice generator, music generator, is it really different? Is it creating something super different from a purpose perspective? Is there a different purpose for that use than the original? And wow. I really? don't know if there is. Well, that's 
one of those tribal issues of fact. We had people calling out in pain when you said that training on their work was maybe part of fair use. Oh, it's interesting, I transcribed every Coltrane solo, every Bird solo, every Brecker solo, every Sanborn solo, and woodshed the hell out of them. Every teacher I ever had said, play it like this, and I'd take my saxophone and try to play it exactly like them. I don't owe any money to the Brecker estate, may he rest in peace, uh, Michael Brecker, um, when I play outside the changes over 251 because I'm, I am channeling my inner Brecker. I'll never get there, but I'm channeling it. Um, Everything I've ever learned about music, I learned from studying people who came before me and the contemporary great artists around me. This is scraping if it, or training on that work and then it's creating new work, which it can't replicate. Like if you ask ChatGPT the same question twice in a row, you get two different answers. And if you ask a music generator, it's gonna give you two different versions. It's as if it never does the same thing twice. Um, discuss. Yeah, so I, I want to discuss that because uh, it, it, this reminds me so much of the early internet discussions. And I want to actually sort of start with a disclaimer, which is uh, I want to put off uh, any normative view on the way the fair use is going to come out because that's to be decided ultimately by the courts. I'm no longer a judge. Okay, so let me just sort of put that out there. Um, but here's the difference that it's not just like a human being going in and reading everything or looking at all the music and really sort of trying to replicate it like that. That's not what AI is doing. How do you know? Because it's copying it. Because what the, the way that it works is it ingests it. The ingestion, think of it as sucking it into the pipe. That's what's happening. It's scraping it. It's copying it, just like it does on the internet, and it's putting it into a variety of servers, and those servers then ingest it into the neural network. It's being copied then yet again. It's being analyzed. It's being analyzed in sequence, because the whole point is to be able to reconstruct the structure. And so it's being analyzed in sequence. And so it's not you and me reading. We're human beings. We don't actually have a copy you can go in and find yet. I, by the but way, Catherine, I, what they're doing is they're copying it onto servers. And it reminds me of the debate when we had at the beginning of the internet when people said, well, I'm, I'm ripping a CD, I'm putting it on the internet. It's not copyright infringement. And I went into court at that point and said, with Jay Cohen sitting over there, and said, this. It's copyright infringement. It looks like a duck. It acts like a duck. It quacks like a duck. By golly, it's a duck. I hate to say this. I, I'm applauding for this because, like, God, I wish what you just said was technically correct, but it isn't. And so, um, uh, ah, I no, it may be legally correct, but it's not technically correct. That's not how generative AI works or stores information. The one part that you got 100% right is what's called self-attention, where the order of whatever the pattern is, is looked at and then it looks back and it actually creates a three-dimensional space in mathematics that takes the next closest, most likely thing that it predicts will make sense to it, which is why it hallucinates, because it's just taking the best Wait, guess. But it's can I ask a question? Or, yeah, go ahead. Number one, I just want to cross-examine you. Go. Cross <laughs> All right, here we are. Okay, so when it's scraping and crawling, is there a copy made? Yes or no? Is there a copy made? Is there a Some, copy made? Depending on the depends model. Depends on the platform. Okay. Depends on the platform. When it goes into the neural network and it's broken into tokens, are there copies made? Are there? Sure. Okay. There's copies. A copy but a frag, is a copy. A, fra fragmented, a fragmented A copy. fragmented copy. Fragmented when you copy. send an email from here to there and you mm -hmm. send it across the internet, yeah. it breaks it into packets, it takes it out of order, and then it puts it back into order, correct? correct? Is that how an email works? That's how email works, right? <laughs> it's a very basic and not uh, quite correct, but I'll, for your argument, go ahead. Okay. I'll accept it. When you take the tokens, and the point is to look at structure, mm -hmm. it is analyzing it necessarily over here, over there, but it's putting it back into, an, into an, a, a sequential structure, not all at once, but so that it can analytically determine the way in which those pieces fit together so that you can tell how John Coltrane sounds. Otherwise, breaking up a John Coltrane song doesn't make any sense. You gotta understand how it sounds. Okay, I, I promise you that everything you said m makes sense to people who don't understand how this works, but if I technically take you through this step by step, you will see that 
part of your argument, and, then what's, and this is why this is going to be really hard, part of what you just described is right. Most of what you just described technologically on most of the platforms we care about right now just isn't the way it works. And it's not the way it's going to work. So I, I think it's really important that we not get caught up in the what is right now. Because if we're going to talk technically, your technology is fleeting. And the, the speed with which this is improving is so ridiculous that I've never seen it in my lifetime, not at this speed. Our only hope is that the business rules that we create and that the copyright protection that we enjoy and that the ability for us to go to the lawmakers and say, we need to be protected financially and here's what we're looking for, that is the first best hope for everybody. Because if you're going to try to beat the tech, I promise you, people are, this is social production now. The way there was social media, we got social production. If that's fair use or not fair use, some judge will decide in five years from now. Five years from now, this isn't going to be an argument anymore. I'm sorry, it won't be. It's an argument today because we can argue it because it hasn't happened yet. But I've never seen anything come at this speed. This is a train coming so fast you can't even imagine it. And Dan and I were just talking a second before we got on stage about just how quick this is coming down. Dan, you want to just you take either side or take the middle or tell me I'm wrong that this isn't coming faster than anything you've ever seen. It, it definitely is. I open with that. I, I truly believe it. I've been in practice for 30 years. I've seen technology. I, way back when ringtones were monophonic and polyphonic, and I told, <laughs> I told Nick Lehman, who worked at MTV, why are you guys investing this? That's why I'm a lawyer and I don't, I don't understand the business. Um, but it, it's, it's here. It's, it's here to stay. It's going to improve like at light speed. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think an industry solution, and it's not just this industry, it's industry solutions. This, I, I harken back, and I've talked about AI quite a bit in the last three months. Um, I was in London, and we were talking about the different in regulations there. And, and that is a, that's a big issue. This is a global problem, right? You, you have a global marketplace for the music industry. It's a global problem because they're thinking about it differently in terms of how to approach it. They're regulating it significantly in the EU. And, and there are major platforms that are upset about it. Poor, poor Google and, every, and Microsoft. But, but at the end of the day, it's a different jurisdiction in terms of how, how, how rights are recognized. And, and in Asia, it's different. There may be a, a different difference of opinion in terms of whether um, a, a machine uh, learned um, product or output of that machine learning model is actually copyrightable in Asia. Um, but, but getting back to it, it's an industry solution, I think, here, because we can't wait for the law to catch up. So collective societies like ASCAP can take, can take charge, right? We, you, you all have power. You all have a voice. We can lobby Congress and lawmakers to make, to make law. But we have to come up with a technological solution. And I harken back to when Napster w w came out. And everybody, that's the end of the world. Like it, We're stealing music. But now look at us. We're paying. Everybody's got a Spotify or Apple Music subscription, virtually everyone, or they're using their parents or whatever it is. Um, but but they're, you know, it's, we are paying for music now, and we have entire libraries of music um, at, our, at our fingertips on demand. Why can't we do the same here? AV, like user-generated content. Content ID came out, created a technological solution for a legal problem, how to claim content. Um, and it was fingerprinting on sound recordings that really solved the issue, um, or not necessarily solved it, but created a business model and a whole ecosystem for rights holders to claim their content. Why can't that be done here? Putting aside whether it's copyrightable or not, like there's a right here that's being implicated, right? There are many rights that are being implicated. They're creator rights. You have to take control. Technological control is one of them. Business rules is another. Yeah, yeah. Catherine, what do you got to say? The final statement, we've got a few minutes left. And before we take questions, or apparently we're taking questions. You know, uh, I still think my technology is right. But I am going <laughs> to go back and read and figure that out. ShellyPalmer.com, uh, go for it. You speak with we, confidence, we, but we, so do I. We boy. build these. I mean, we build and these. We, we literally build these systems. So, I, I mean, I, it's, I, 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 I hate, I am not, I, I can just show you. No, I, mean, I, I understand. I just show I, uh, well, we won't, I won't spend my last minute on that. Well, I'll spend my last minute on <laughs> is saying that, uh, look, th this is a transformative moment, but they, there's a real opportunity here. And when I talk about uh, using some of the tools maybe to help shape also 
some of the music that can be made. People have been using computers to make music for a very long time and have been using ways to make new sounds for a very long time in very positive ways. And there's got to be a way to adapt it. It's not going to go away. There's no lawsuit in the world that's going to stop this. So there may be an issue about being paid. But more than being paid, I'm sure you want to work and create and do your art. And there's a way to use these tools to continue to do art. And I encourage you to do that. Love your stuff. And that's what I've got to say. John? If you're interested in the Copyright Office's views, and, and by the way, we are a little ahead of the game compared to some countries because in the United States, a copyright registration is reviewed for copyrightability by the Copyright Office before it's granted, which does not happen in other countries. Uh, if you're interested in the Copyright Office's AI initiative, it's at copyright.gov slash AI. If you're interested in what types of AI technologies you might use as a part of a work that has a human authorship component to it. We have issued some guidance on that. We have actually issued, a, a, put out a video that should be on our website in a couple of weeks, uh, but it was a live webinar. We are having an international um, symposium online in a week, and this is gonna be a continuing discussion. I've heard a lot about AI uh, moving too fast for the regulators. Maybe, but also please get your information into us, into uh, Congress, because you know they say that the 19, Copyright Act of uh, 1976 was a good 1950s copyright law. You know the MMA uh, discussion started in 2004, passed was in 2018. Change will come, um, but it's really going to be shaped by the input that the regulators in Congress gets. Thank you. Look, guys, we're going to take some questions. I just want you to understand. First of all, I'm on your side because it, this, it, this impacts me exactly the same way it impacts you. I make my living off my quarterly checks, like it a lot. I have other ways I make a living too, but boy, when the checks show up, they make me very, very happy. Um, what's really important is that everyone in this room, engineer or not, and Catherine and I sparred a little bit, that's fun for me, and hopefully you're, you were entertained by it, because um, she got some applause and I got some booze, so that's awesome. <laughs> But here's the thing. This is intelligence decoupled from consciousness, and we don't know what that means. And every human being in this room has big feelings, and they are right. Your feelings are as valid as mine. My engineers, who know more than I know, uh, I code, but the guys I hire to code code way better than I do. That's why I hire them. They, they don't know any more than you do. This is your business. This is your life. This is our world. So you need to get involved in this in every way you can. ASCAP has taken a big, big, big swing at this, but you gotta do this too. Call your congressmen, call your senators, call everybody. Have your own discussions, be involved in this, and don't think for one second that your feelings don't matter or that your opinion doesn't matter because you're not technical. Catherine and I can have a technical conversation all day long. That's not gonna change this. You're gonna change it. You, every one of you. So let's start there. All right, let's get some questions. I can't see, but I, I know there's a mic runner or two out there. So if you don't have a microphone, you're not allowed to ask a question, apparently. Uh, let, oh, that's better. So yeah, I just mic runner hand the microphone and someone, someone that way I'll just start talking because I literally can't see. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kentucky Parkus, and I'm here with my partner from the Sky Band. We both do music and music videos. I'm also a member of the Local 802, the American Federation of Musicians. And I'm really concerned why they're not here and why and how are, is ASCAP going to work with the Musicians Union because it's music that's being stolen as well as just a stem of our voice. I think we should ask our friends at Local 802. I'm a card-carrying member there, too. I think that that's probably outside the scope of this panel, unless someone here is an 802 member also and wants to speak for AFM or ASCAP. Um, apologies. I just don't think it's in the scope of our panel to beat up on the AFM right now. Um, God bless them and hope that they understand the peril they're in. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, great discussion. Thank you very much. Um, so we're just getting into this. Uh, this, 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 this new uh, age uh, that uh, Dan mentioned, ringtones, right? The internet, you, 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 you mentioned, all of these revolutionary things within our lifetime. And now we have this technology that's moving faster than our minds can, yes. can, can, can grasp. 
So with that being said, we can't even come to a, a certain understanding of how we're going to operate business with creativity with this revolutionary thing, but in that same space and time that we're trying to grasp this, this concept, the technology is advancing at light speed, as you said. Yeah. So once we come to a, to, a, to a firm agreement, okay, this is the law of this, the, 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 the technology is gonna be light speed ahead from what we even understand right now. Yes. So I don't know. Just uh, well, discuss. I, I can tell you that <laughs> that is that is that is definitely true, and it has been true since the advent of the industrial revolution, and it will continue to be true forever. Yeah. Technology will always be way ahead of where we're at because it just it's being developed that quickly, and and computing is just becoming you know, astronomically quick and efficient. So that doesn't change the fact that, that industries can develop business models and, and you can profit off of those and you can, you can use this and leverage the technology as it is today, as it will be in the next three to five years to become more productive, to become more efficient, to create. Um, that's the whole point of this, right? It's, it's to protect your core assets, but also to automate Things in in your in your in your work that that are are difficult and and time consuming, so you can cre you can concentrate on what really matters, which is the creative side of things. Um, and and I, I think there like I agree. I, there's I agree with Catherine. There's a great opportunity here. There's certainly quite a few risks, but those risks will be resolved. They will be resolved as we go. Um, and there will be litigation, and there will be precedent that 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 creates rules of the road. There will be industries that create. Um, new revenue models and revenue streams for you and other creators um, to, to profit off of. And you'll see a lot of people a lot of, make a lot of money and there'll be a lot of mistakes along the way. But ultimately, that, that, that's always going to be true. I would simply say you need to take this, as we all do, as a call to action. One of the things about the speed with which this is coming, because it is faster than anything anyone has ever seen, no matter who they are, um, we used to be able to get a couple months where, you know, I can learn email, I can learn PowerPoint, I can learn Excel, I can learn whatever, I can learn social media, I can learn, okay, wow, now there's Instagram, I got to figure out the syntax of Instagram versus Twitter, like we've always had to do that, but you had some time to do it. Now, just take it as a call to action. Get deep today. Get deep today. Like just, this is your new job. It's a composer, I need to have an AI coworker. My AI coworker is gonna do certain things. My AI co-composer is gonna do certain things and for me and certain things to me and I need to know what those are. And you need your own opinion about it. So the only way to get your own opinion about it, like how many people in this room have a paid chat GPT account? Paid. Okay, the rest of you, go home tonight, drop the 20 bucks and figure out what this thing will do. Because if you, you can't sit here and be scared of it, if you aren't in it every day, get in it now, today. Because we, you don't have the time to wait till someone else does it for you, which you have always had in previous technological events. I'll leave it there. Last question, we have one more, time for one more. Love and light to the audience. I'm so excited to be here. I go by Juanita Purcell, and I'm also known as Harlem's First Lady. I am typically someone who is very, very big on educating my tribe of individuals on the importance of metadata and those digital identifiers. The issue with us not being able to own our assets and our content is for the simple fact that we are not knowledgeable on how to extract our digital identifiers. You have to find out what codes are specific on the back end of your metadata. Open your portals, activate 20 of them, extract your digital identifiers, encode your metadata, and properly label your content. This was an absolute amazing discussion. Catherine, please respond to my LinkedIn Direct message. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Well, Th thank you so I, much for can that. Can I say one thing about the metadata? Common crawl ha contains metadata, common crawl. So uh, one thing to be aware of is uh, there are certain LLMs that actually scrape common crawl, and you can get some common crawl metadata. 
Yep, very important. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a discussion that cannot end here. Have it in your homes, have it in your workplace, have this discussion with anyone who will listen to you and remember your feelings, technical or not, are more important than the technology itself. So assert what it is you want to assert and you be the architects of the world you want to live in because no one else is going to do it for you. Thanks so much. Thanks to the panel. Get a hand for our great panelists and our moderator. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Dan.